اضطراب كثير والبعض يقول انها مؤامره او انه من الاحتلال لا هي عمليه من اخوانكم في كتائب القسام قاموا بها نصره لاخوانهم الاسرى في داخل السجون mm. In the Middle East is perhaps more delicate and dangerous than, than ever. There are numerous power blocks, rival ideologies at work. Uh, and there you saw now Hamas admitting, after so much denial, they uh, kidnapped and murdered those three Israeli teens. Daniel Pipes, uh, wonderful always to have him on the show, joins us from Philadelphia. It, it, it's fascinating that I received tweets from various people in the past few weeks saying, how do you know it's Hamas? It's not Hamas. The crazies said it's just a Zionist plot. Others said, no, it was a, it was a rival gangster group in the West Bank. They've now admitted it, and I suppose they've boasted of it. They certainly have, yes. It's part of their campaign to inflict pain on Israelis. Murder, mayhem, rockets, tunnels, abduction, yes. Now, the curious thing is that they can't win that way. And I think they know they can't win against Israel, which is a powerful state. But they can provoke the Israelis to attack them and thereby get favorable publicity. How many newspaper and television accounts focus only on the deaths in, in Gaza and not in Israel? Today, there was an Israeli four-year-old who was killed by a rocket. We don't generally hear about that. That's the Hamas strategic doctrine. It's a very strange one, and it goes against millennia of warfare to provoke a stronger enemy to hit you and hurt you. But that is what Hamas is doing, mm. and with some success. Yeah. It, it's actually uh, quite reminiscent of, of a certain type of Marxist ideology from the 60s and 70s. You provoke a state into becoming oppressive. You, you, you commit acts of terror until the state is in itself oppressive towards you, and then you can claim that you're a victim. Yeah. The uh, British government has suggested that it will cut off any further arms shipments to Israel if there's a resumption of war. Well, Hamas resumes war and uh, Israel pays the price, or might pay the price. It, it's a very strange situation. But I think overall it's not working that well for Hamas. It hasn't got the backing of most of the Middle Eastern states, the one, the heavyweights like Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Jordan. It's not doing very well. There's a lot of anger at Hamas for being aligned with Iran, which is seen by many in the Middle East now as the revisionist and threatening power. Not Israel, Iran. This is something new. Very interesting. Now, uh, Israel uh, targeted attacks. Three leaders of Hamas were killed. Hamas always then promised that the gates of hell will be opened. I'm not sure what that means, because I thought they'd opened them many times in, in the past. But taking out these leaders, it, it does surely hurt Hamas, and they then executed almost 20 people in Gaza, Palestinians they claim were Israeli agents. I'm sure they weren't. So Israel's having some success, isn't it? It's having some success. And mind you, all this is happening as Israel is providing electricity to Gaza. Uh, Gaza would go dark without the Israelis continuing to pro provide electricity. And I don't know why the Israelis are doing it. It's certainly not a requirement of international law. And yet the Israelis are doing it. So they have this trump card in their hand that they could use at any time. For reasons I can't explain to you, they've chosen so far not to use it. But this would really put pressure in a nonviolent way on Hamas, on Gazans in general, to come to terms, to stop sending rockets. It sent uh, over 100 rockets in the last couple of days. Mm. This would be, I think, a powerful incentive. But the Israelis haven't used it yet. Mm. Those men, by the way, who were executed by Hamas in Gaza, who do we know much about them? And I assume they're not working for Israel. I assume there's some form of dissidence within the Palestinian community. I, I don't know much about them. Uh, and uh, you may be right, but there could be that there is some real connection between them and the targeting. I mean, after all, Israel does have Israeli security and intelligence services do have real informants. Uh, they have been successful in uh, pinpointing their targets whether it be individuals or uh, installations, by virtue of having people on the ground in Gaza. So it's not fantasy on Hamas's part to think that there are informants. And indeed, this has been something that not just Israel, but even before the Zionist movement has focused on, is having information, intelligence coming on from the other side. And it's done very well by it. it uh, so I, I'm not inclined to think it's total fantasy on Hamas's part. Right. Though whether they got the right people or not, I certainly can't tell you. Yeah. Let's uh, move uh, across the region to what is happening, of course. It, it, it's so notorious now. 
uh, in Iraq and to a degree in Syria and the, the work of ISIS. And this is it's so shocking, but I don't think it should be surprising to a lot of people. Uh, how is, we're seeing little reaction in the Islamic diaspora. What is the reaction with, within the Islamic power base in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt? How, how do they react to ISIS? Well, among the establishments, the governments and so forth, there is a horror of what's taking place. This is taking radical Islam to its extreme. I don't think one can go further than ISIS. Mm. And ISIS is a kind of nightmare of Sunni Islam. Uh, Al-Qaeda is even moderate by the standards of ISIS. Uh, and so the Saudis, who only a decade ago seemed like the worst uh, ex extreme kind of uh, Islamist, is uh, rather looking tame these days. Mm. Qatar is worse. So we're, what we're getting is division after division of more and more extreme forms of, of Sunni Islam. And ISIS is the ultimate. Now, the striking thing about ISIS is it has no allies. Yes, it had Turkish and Qatari support in the past, but they weren't supporting a universal caliphate. They were supporting it against the regime of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. Now it, it doesn't have allies. It is surrounded by enemies. And therefore, it is my prediction that it's not going to last very long. It just has too many enemies. On the other hand, the idea of the caliphate, which ISIS resurrected just uh, in June, just a couple months ago, is, I think, a powerful one and one that's going to live on. So while this particular Islamic state, so-called, is going to be gone before long, the notion of the caliphate, the ideal of the caliphate, the excitement about a caliphate is going to live on. We're going to see many, many caliphates, I think, whether it be extremists like Boko Haram in Nigeria or governments like the Saudi government or the Iranian government or even the Turkish government. I can see caliphates sprouting up all over the place. Mm. And this is not a good thing. This is a, uh, a very bad development. A caliphate implies universal uh, jurisdiction, a state that rules the globe. Mm, not something <laughs> that we really want to have today, but thanks to ISIS, we do have it. Just very briefly, we haven't heard too much about Assad until quite recently. Uh, I would think Syria now has to be a smaller state than it was, but is he relatively secure at this point? Yeah, Syria has divided into three parts. <clears throat> the Kurds off in the northeast, wanting to be left alone, and the rest of the country divided in two between the Assad government in the middle and the Sunni rebels on either side of it, to make it simple. Uh, and it's quite stable at this point. It hasn't changed much over a couple of years. And uh, so Syria's divided in three. I think it's going to be very hard for either of the two contending sides to prevail. And from my point of view, that's okay. I don't want to see ISIS rule, and I don't want to see us or dominate, victorious. I want to see Assad. They're both horrible. It's, one could have a, you know, it's like Hitler and Stalin, which one is worse? Yeah. We can have a long debate over this. But we can just agree they're both, you know, repugnant monsters, and that's what we have in Syria. And let them fight each other. And uh, I believe what we in the West should be doing is helping the side that's losing so they continue to fight each other till, till death. You know, uh, we, we don't want to help either side in any constructive sense. We want to help them continue now, you know, the fight so they battle each other. As, as we're out of time. I wish we had more. But as always, it's a, it's a great pleasure. Thank you so very much indeed. Thank, thank you. Always a pleasure.